like anxiety is actually a really good thing for us, right? Like you worried about the next like 20 years, 30 years of your life. Great. Let's make a, I don't know, a loose plan for that. Worried about what you're going to do in retirement. Worried that social security isn't going to work out. Great. Let's make a little plan for that. Right. Like there's a, there's a functional amount of anxiety that shows up. That's like, Hey, um, this marriage thing that we are committing to, it's actually pretty important. It's like the most important thing in our lives right now. So like, I don't know, like maybe let's make a, let's make a plan for the hard times. Hello, my friend, and welcome to something for everybody. My name is Aaron Mashpitz. Jen, welcome to the show. What's up? <laughs> Not much. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, um, yeah, excited to excited to chat with you. Uh, and before we jump really uh, super deep into all the good stuff, um, my first and most important question is, how are you doing? Like, actually, how are you doing? How am I actually doing? Um, I so my my six year old is in her final week of kindergarten. My two year old has uh, learned how to climb out of her crib. And I have the first like solo mommy girls trip coming up in four days. So I feel like I'm at this, like this, like running point. Like, I feel like I'm sprinting, you know what I mean? Like I, like inside it feels like run, 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 run. Even though nothing has actually changed on the outside, I just noticed this, like, I feel this sense of urgency right now. Um, it's it's a curious experience. It's fine. It's fine enough, right? Like I don't, I'm not responding to that by actually like running, but it is a, it is, it's like when you're sitting in traffic and you're like, oh my God, I got to get there. I got to get there. But you're fucking holding still. Like you're not going anywhere. Um, yeah. Anyway. So that's, that is at present. That is, that's where I'm at. How are you actually doing, Aaron? Oh man, I uh, I've never had it so good. Everything's pretty pretty freaking good right now. Uh, recently, I've been saying I've never had it so good, and I feel like I'm the luckiest man in the world. Uh, so yeah, like I'm about to get married in September, so all of that stuff <laughs> is very exciting. Um, I'm in the middle of baseball season, which is I love that because I get to spend a lot of time with my 15 year old boys. Mm. Uh, and yeah, and I get to do this for a living, which is a wild concept. So yeah, freaking sweet, Jenny. It's freaking sweet. <laughs> Things are good. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, but I, I was going to ask you a follow up question about that because at some point in my life, hopefully God willing, I'll become a parent. And mm. from what I hear from some of my friends is that it always feels like sort of a sprint, like you're always in a sense of urgency and you being an anxiety specialist, like how has mm. that, you know, played a role in you trying to figure out how you feel in those moments where you feel like everything is like spinning? Yeah. Yeah. That, that's a great question. And yeah, as, as, as they become more mobile, I notice this, this sense of like running and urgency that is just pretty persistent in me. And then we sign them up for things, you know, like, you want them to be active. So you sign them up for sports and then you're just packed. You don't like really consider the implications of all of these different things that are so great for them. Um, you don't really consider the implications of that on your schedule and like balancing all these different things. So, it, you know, as, as an anxiety specialist, I think I, I work with a lot of parents who also experience this. And and for me, what I notice is that when I am just sort of stuck in autopilot and like, go, 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 like when I am, res when I'm reacting to that sense of urgency and not um, pausing and responding, it's a really different experience with my kids. Right. But when I, when I can take a moment just to like allow that, that sense of urgency to be present and also attend to the moment and be present with my children I, it's it's such a richer experience and so much more meaningful and vibrant. Um, but you know, I'm, I am a human and I get stuck on autopilot too and led away and snippety and don't do that and you know all the all the things 
that we do when we feel really urgent. Yeah. But I, I imagine like for so many parents who haven't equipped themselves with some of these tools, like mm -hmm. it's much, much worse. And yeah. I, I don't really like, maybe this seems harsh cause I'm not a parent yet, but I, I, I don't find it like an excuse anymore to not yeah. have these tools before we become a parent. Like I understand there's certain situations where it was like unplanned and there's horrible stuff that happened. I get those. We'll put that in a separate bucket. But like you, mm -hmm. you plan to have a baby with this person. Why would you not become as prepared as possible by learning at least like the basic foundational level of, you know, mental skills or how to respond or how to use your breath or all these certain things that go into it? Because, you know, going in like shit's going to be crazy. And mm -hmm. no matter how many tools you have, like you said, you're still going to mess up. We're not going to be perfect. And we can admit to those things. And that's an important part to teach young people. But man, like, I just don't find it like an excuse anymore. Like, oh, I, I didn't know. Like, why didn't you know? There's a thousand mm -hmm. free resources available all, all over the world. And maybe, again, that's harsh. Maybe I'm coming from a wrong place because I don't have a kid. And maybe I'll get some criticism for that. But like, that's <laughs> just how I feel. Light them up in the comment section. No, you know, um, I, I appreciate that stance. Right. And, and I think that the same can be said for any um, meaningful thing that you take on in your life. Right. Like, why not go into this as prepared as possible? I mean, I, I remember when when Elsie was born in the hospital the you know, I, I had a C-section that was planned. Love that for me. We found out she was breached and they're like, you want to spin her around and try and shoot her out your. And then I was like, no, just. <laughs> let's just take that. So we plan the C-section, right? Like even planning that, like we planned that. And then, and then the day came where we left and they came in to check that we could buckle her into the seatbelt. And then that was it. They were like, you're good to go. And so I don't know what my husband and I were expecting, but it was some, it was, it was more of a checks and balances. We had hoped like, have you like, I don't know, talked about, you know, whether you're going to do a 529 for this kid, or have you talked about like what you're going to do when you feel so overwhelmed that you like want to cry or um yeah like have have you have you guys really figured out how you're going to deal with the really difficult moments of being a parent but that conversation didn't happen in the hospital and a lot of us don't have that conversation before we become parents in, in the same way that like we do a lot of planning for the wedding. I don't know. I mean, how much planning are you doing for your wedding right now? Yeah. I mean, we, we've been engaged since May of last year. So most of the planning is pretty much done now, like three months ahead of our <clears throat> wedding, but yeah, a ton. I mean, I feel like people do more planning for their wedding than for the hard conversations that are going to come when we talk about finances or, you know, uh, who should we visit on Thanksgiving or like mm -hmm. whatever, right? It's like the the first two parts, I, I've split our relationship up into three parts. Like one mm. is like when we're dating, the sort of getting ready for the marriage and the marriage, and then hopefully lifetime that we have together afterwards. Mm -hmm. And I mm -hmm. feel like people put more emphasis on the first two than the, than the last third. And obviously the last third is the most important part. Like that's where everything is going to be expressed. Like if you really truly are committed to the things that you said you were going to be committed to. Um, and so, I mean, I try to do a job, a good job with my fiance. We have some business meetings every month and we go over mm -hmm. lots of different things. And maybe that's because of my athlete brain and I have to do those sorts of things or else I feel unprepared or mm. whatever the case may be. But uh, yeah, um, so that's, that's how we've done it. Yeah. I mean, you, your prefrontal cortex is firing on all cylinders, my friend, right? Like you've, <laughs> <laughs> you've got the planning down, you've got the like, let's, you've got a little bit of like catastrophic thinking that is, is functional, right? Like, a, like anxiety is actually a really good thing for us, right? Like you worried about the next like 20 years, 30 years of your life. Great. Let's make a, I don't know, a loose plan for that. Worried about what you're going to do in retirement. Worried that social security isn't going to work out. Great. Let's make a little plan for that. Right. Like there's a, there's a functional amount of anxiety that shows up. That's like, Hey, um, this marriage thing that we are committing to, it's actually pretty important. It's like the most important thing in our lives right now. So like, I don't know, like maybe let's make a, let's make a plan for, the hard times like how are we going to show up in one another's lives when 
when my husband and I first got together, um, I, I was, so I was coming out before I became a therapist, I was a porn star. Right. And so I was coming out of the adult industry and I was in therapy and I was going back to school to learn how to help people. And, you know, I, I sat down with him and I said, listen, I have burned every relationship that I have had, you know, in, in terms of like, I light my relationships on fire and I have slept with enough people to know what I like and what I don't like and what I want to do. Like I have, I've ruined enough relationships to know what I want to do next. And it's not the things I've been doing. And he was, he was like, and that includes finances. Like I have, I have made a, a financial disaster for myself and I, I have picked it up and I've moved on. I've got nothing. I'm riding the bus, you know? So that's where I'm at and I want to do it differently with you. And he said, you know what, Jenny, I have destroyed relationships too. I have, I have annihilated them and I'm not making a lot of money and I don't know if I'm ever going to. And I want to be really intentional about how we and it, it was such a, a vulnerable conversation to have, right? This like um, acknowledgement of the ways in which we have made mistakes and, and the things that we've learned from those mistakes, right? Like I, I have learned that I, I don't ever want to sneak out of a house in the middle of the night to go and just disappear from the relationship. Like that is actually not an effective way of ending a relationship. It's effective. That's not who I want to be when I end a relationship. Um, so, so to that point of like, I, I think it takes a lot of humility to sit down with your partner mm -hmm. and say, um, like, what, how do we want to do this together? It's a really scary, vulnerable place for, for parenting. I think there are some, really great resources out there for people and, and you're not going to do it perfectly. There's a certain amount of prep you can do, but once you're in the game, you know, nobody knows what's going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That, that, uh, leads me to initially <laughs> how I wanted to start this conversation, <laughs> but we got on a great tangent, which was amazing. So, so thanks for following me on that, on that path. Yeah. But, uh, this concept of psychological flexibility, I think that's mm. important to you and your work. What does that mean? And how can we develop that more in our lives? Yeah, it, that's a great question. So, so the psychological flexibility is really just like this idea that you can behave flexibly in any given situation, right? So what the literature and research on psychological well-being shows is that when we respond rigidly, um, we end up being m more prone to psychological illnesses, right? So for example, one process of behavior is uh, like present moment awareness. That's what we were talking about a little bit earlier, right? Are you paying attention only to the future? Are you only paying attention to the past? Because if you are, right, that, that sort of like rigid attention, that rigid attending to the future, you're probably going to be pretty anxious. And if you're rigidly attending only to the past, you're probably going to be pretty depressed, right? You're going to miss a lot of what's happening right now. And sometimes right now is really uncomfortable, right? So like with parenting, right? Like um, I remember early in Elsie's life, I, she would cry. And my dad had, my, my dad actually died two days before she was born. So it needless to say, it was a really hard time in my life. And sometimes at four o'clock in the morning, I would get up to nurse her and she would cry and I wouldn't be able to soothe her. And I would think this is going to happen forever. She is going to cry forever. I am never going to sleep again. And I could build out the next 18 years of her life in my care where she's crying and not sleeping. And like, it's never like that is the few, and I could only attend there. But if I could just be present with that discomfort, then sure, I'm uncomfortable. And also I'm present, right? So it's psychological flexibility is really just the ability to behave flexibly, no matter what is showing up um, as it's showing up. Yeah, I um I've tried to 
teach that same idea to my athletes. Um, and it's why I named my business uh, Champions Adjust because it basically mm -hmm. says the same thing that psychological mm -hmm. flexibility does. If we want to be mm -hmm. sort of great at anything, whatever that may be, being a mother, baseball player, yada, 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 we have to be able to adjust to the present moment. We have to be able to accept that this is our current reality and put our best foot forward knowing that this is what it is. And mm -hmm. I, I love the concept. Uh, and I think it's such an important piece for anyone who's trying to navigate how hard life is. I just always mm -hmm. use a sports reference because that's just where my brain goes. But <laughs> there's there's tons of other things, obviously, that are important that people have to navigate in life using this concept of, of psychological flexibility. Um, mm -hmm. But how can people, uh, what are ways that you teach your clients to develop that, you know, maybe present moment awareness or being more mindful or you know, not getting too stuck in a certain thing or whatever the case may be. Mm -hmm. So, so a lot of clients who come my way are um, rigidly avoiding stuff, right? So experiential acceptance is one of these like psychological flexibility processes. Can you accept whatever experience is happening right now? That doesn't necessarily mean condone or um, like, am I okay with the circumstances? But like, can I accept feeling fear? Can I accept feeling sad? Can I accept, right, these like internal experiences that are happening? So a lot of people come to me feeling really anxious. I don't want to feel anxious is often a goal I hear. I just don't, I don't want to be this anxious anymore. And so a lot of the work that we actually do is to begin practicing feeling anxious. So for example, um, I work with people who have panic attacks pretty frequently, right? And they, they come and they say, I, I don't want to have panic attacks anymore. <laughs> like I keep having panic attacks. I am over this. I'm done. And what we actually do is teach them how to have panic attacks. What that process looks like is we will create um, experiences for them that uh, allow them to experience the symptoms of a panic attack. Right. So you come to me, you say like, OK, like every time I have a panic attack, I I feel like I'm like floating up in the corner of the room. My chest is racing. I get really hot and sweaty in my armpits. My hands feel tingly. Right. And you, you sort of go through the list. And I have all of these exercises that help you practice feeling that way. Right. And so the intention isn't that we stop you from having panic attacks. The intention is actually that you learn that a panic attack isn't actually a threat and you don't have to fight against it. It's just the way that you feel. It's kind of like having an upset stomach, right? Like sometimes you sort of like, your tummy's just a little upset. And if you find yourself fighting against it, you might find yourself doing things that are sort of not the healthiest. Yeah, so, so a lot of the work that I do is about teaching people how to um, like radically accept who they are, the thoughts that they have, the stuff that happens inside of this meat suit that they're living in. It's, it's a lot of like radical acceptance and, um, learning how to like fully embrace this experience of being human. So that, so the next thing I, I wanted to touch on now that we've talked about technology is uh people's overuse um and maybe the impacts of digital overuse um with anxiety um so how do those things go sort of hand in hand and and how do you think about dealing with that look the the smartphone is a it's a great eject button from whatever's happening right now right like if you feel awkward and you're riding in an elevator you can open up your smartphone if you are waiting for the bus and are bored, you can open up a smartphone. If you're dealing with a, an insane toddler who is like destroying your home and trying to kill themselves by putting things in their mouth that you like swore you cleaned up off the floor, like you swear it was clean, right? Uh, a smartphone's a great place to to eject. It's, it's a great escape hatch, right? And so I see a lot of people who come in and are feeling really, really anxious and they're using their smartphone as a way of escaping 
that anxiety, right? And it isn't to say that smartphones don't have some value or that like you can't do really meaningful things in smartphones, right? Like I'm learning how to speak Spanish with my smartphone, love Duolingo. Um, th that's a really values oriented activity, right? But when you're using this device as a way to escape your either internal experience or the circumstances that you find yourself in, it doesn't actually fix that internal experience or fix the circumstances that are so intolerable in your life, right? It just sort of prolongs it. You also don't have an opportunity to see if you can feel anxious. Like how anxious can you feel? How much fear can you tolerate, right? Like we consistently sell ourselves short, right? And so smartphones are turning into this um, really specific safety behavior where we're like, oh, I don't know what to do. And then we just turn to it. But when we were kids, I don't know. I, I don't know how old you are. I'm, I'm 41, right? And like, I didn't have a smartphone when I was a kid. And so when I was bored, I either had to just be bored or I had to figure it the fuck out. Or I had to figure something. I don't know if I'm supposed to swear, but I'm, I swear like a sailor in case that hasn't become apparent. So sorry, Ben, you're a legend if you have to cut all that out. Um, when 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 I was a kid, we had to figure it out, right? You you made your own fun. You didn't have things sort of forced down your throat. And when your parents did either over schedule or over book or like try and press upon you these like, oh, this will be fun. This will be fun. More often than not, it was like, stop, mom, like, stop. I don't like, ah, oh, God, you know, like, leave me alone. <laughs> And, and the smartphone has become such an easy, um, an easy way to get fed entertainment, right? So there's no, um, no effort required. So it's, it, it's really a tough place when it comes to like this intersection of like smartphone use and like connection, cause it, it does offer that. And, um, and also like anxiety um, lengthening because it does, and it, it creates more anxiety in the long run as well. And so, um, you know, I think, I think we're at a pretty pivotal point in our world and in our experience as humans with this technology and like, how do we want to use it? How can we start to be more mindful about how we use it and how, um, how can we teach our kids to, to use this thing that is actually, um, a really challenging thing to use. Yeah. How are you thinking about your daughter, you know, sort of becoming of an age where sometimes people get a phone? Uh, mm -hmm. And I know you, you uh, have heard Jonathan Hyde talk about collective action, which I think is amazing mm -hmm. when it comes to smartphone use. So have you created a pact with some parents about maybe a certain mm -hmm. age that you guys want to get a phone for your kids so they don't feel left out and all these things that go along with, the phone and things of that nature. Yeah. Yeah. So it's a great question. So I think, I think in regard to Jonathan Haidt's idea of collective action, we as parents and as adults will be required to tolerate the distress of our children. So if you're getting your kid a phone, so they don't feel left out, that's, that's not it. You know, like your kid's going to feel left out once they have a phone too, because they're going to see their friends doing amazing things. They're going to see influencers doing these amazing things, right? Like they're going to be transported into this like amazing portal of like glorious life and beauty and, uh, and vacations and like filters that is so unachievable that it will actually exacerbate that, that like FOMO sense, right? Like they will miss out. And then they'll also miss out on their like real life experiences, right? Like there, it, as a kid, there's like nothing more. Well, for me, there was nothing more like thrilling and also terrifying than like talking to a boy for the first time. Right. And like, you just don't get that in the smartphone world, right? It's, it's this really muted experience. So, so I, I have a pact with some mommies. It's a little bit of a like middle, a middle school girls pregnancy pact kind of thing, right? We're like, we're all going to do this together. I'm okay with that. Um, 
And we have agreed we're not going to give our kids smartphones until they're 16. And we're going to delay their access to social media until they're 18. Um, there's some really great, uh, like, it, it's like um, monitoring software that's coming out right now. Because there's, there's no way that I'm going to be able to log into either of my girls' phones and like actually tell what they've been doing. They're going to be far more skilled with the tech by that time than I am. I, I, I mentioned when we first hopped on the call, I already have this ongoing like battle with technology and make like homicidal threats at my computer all the time. And so, and my internet connection, right? So um, yeah, so I, I, there's, there's great tech out there. There's great software that you can use to like integrate all of the, um, all, all of the devices that you have, but yeah, so I'm, 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 I'm going to do the collective action thing, but I think the collective action thing like Jonathan Haidt outlines requires all of us to do it together, which will help reduce some of the distress of saying no to our kids. Um, but we also need to be able to model that behavior. So we need to show them how to do it. Um, cause otherwise they're not going to learn. Yeah. Yeah. Modeling that behavior is, is wildly important. Um, yeah you know, especially from the adults in their life, whether that be coaches, teachers, parents, if we're constantly dialed in on our phone and then we tell them to get off their phone, mm -hmm. like I, I've learned that lesson very quick coaching young boys. Like if I don't do what I'm telling them to do, they're not going to do it. And that makes mm -hmm. a lot of sense that I have, I have to hold myself accountable in the same regard that I am holding them accountable. If I don't want them to uh, throw their equipment after something bad happens, I cannot throw my equipment after something bad happens. It's mm -hmm. the same process with the phone. Um, mm -hmm. Our standard on our team is that once we leave our car, we have our phone put away until we get back in the car. I have to model that same behavior as well. And we know mm -hmm. like certain circumstances come up. Okay, I need to check the, the schedule for the next game or what field is that? Or I need to call my mom because the game ended early. Yeah, great. Let's get our phones out for that. But we know majority mm -hmm. of the time, that's the standard we set for the team. And if I don't do it, then it seems like it's okay for everyone else to have their phone out in between games in the dugout. And then, you know, obviously the, the lack of focus and clarity about what's happening you know, causes them to whatever, to have bad performance, but that's less important about the standard that we're trying to set. And so mm -hmm. collective action, again, like you said, is, is wickedly important, but also mm -hmm. uh, modeling that behavior from top down is also what kids are going to respond to. Totally. And what I think is so beautiful about the the context that you're setting up, right? Like is that there are really clear intentions, right? Like when, when we are at practice, we attend to practice. We pay attention to what's happening out here. We pay attention to each other. We listen to each other. And if we do choose to use our phones, fine. What's the intention there? I need to call my mom to do this very specific thing. I need to check the game, like the schedule for the, like, it's such a specific intentional use of this device, as opposed to the sort of like mindless, like suck that, that happens just as a feature of being human with brains that are susceptible to being sucked into things. Um, right. Yeah. Yeah. What do you think uh, social media is doing to the perception young girls have of their body? specifically maybe body dysmorphia or, I mean, I know maybe that's a long answer, but uh, what, what do you, what have you seen? And maybe potentially what are you worried about for your own daughter? Yeah. I mean, I mean, so as someone who has suffered with body dysmorphia and disordered eating, um, I, I know it's in, it's that sort of way of relating to my body. I, I know about that personally. Right. And clinically, um, I see it in a lot of my young women, right? Where the the more we are exposed to these unrealistic images and these unrealistic and and curated and uh, filtered images, the the more distorted the view is that we have of ourselves. So there's definitely an impact, right? And um, there, there's good data on it that that shows that we end up having like higher rates of distorted self view and experience of ourselves the more that we're exposed to social media. Um, and, and it happens for men too, right? I, I don't want to exclude, um, and, and gender non-binary people, right? Like it happens across the board that the more that we're exposed to these 
curated and um, uh, filtered image, just reinforcing that level of unrealistic expectations. There's a lot of suffering that comes there. So, so the majority of the young people that I work with, we, well, the majority of the people that I work with, we create some sort of like digital nutrition plan for them. And a lot of it involves cutting out social media. Um, and even beyond body dysmorphia with social media specifically, especially things where like um, you can see how many people have seen your post, you can see what your friends are doing, or there's like soft blocks or whatever, they like unfollow you. And there's, there's so many subtle ways to cut you apart and to like cut apart the fabric of the relationships. Um, yeah, we're really trying to stay away from social media for my kids, for me, and it, which is also a fine line because I'm going to do a lot of advertising for this on social media. Right? So it's like, it's, it's complicated, right? It's very, very complicated and such a, such a double-edged sword. Uh, <laughs> but I, I do think the most important word that we're talking about here is intentionality. When we have some yeah. sort of intentionality with how we use social media, it can be very, very beneficial. It really can yeah. be. Like for me, I like when I'm at my best, when I'm, I'm not always at my best, obviously I doom scroll mm -hmm. all the time. But when I'm at my mm -hmm. best, I'm on social media to look for interesting people to talk to. And I find them mm -hmm. everywhere. Mm -hmm. And that is mm -hmm. awesome. Like, oh, this person's doing this. They're talking about this. Wow, that's so fucking cool. Maybe I could talk to them. When I'm very intentional about it, that's it, it benefits me. I feel good when I get off my phone when I do that. Because so I just like found like 18 people that are like changing the world and very few people mm -hmm. know about them. Great. That's awesome. When I'm not intentional, mm -hmm. I'm like, cool. I mean, I'm not looking at like stuff that's like, like, I don't know what bad is. But like, you know, maybe they're just like funny videos or whatever pops up. Like it's still mm -hmm. a waste of my time. And so mm -hmm. uh, it's really hard to teach an adult to be intentional about their social media use. And so even harder for kids about it. So like we have to start implementing those ideas now, which you're doing, um, which is great. So then when they do get to of age where they have a little bit more, they feel like they have more responsibility over their lives. They have an idea of what to do with social media because it's only getting more. And I, and yeah. I like you specifically how you're, you, you never demonize social media mm -hmm. or the phone because you know it's not going away. There's no reason mm -hmm. to do that. Doesn't, doesn't mm -hmm. make anyone more attracted to your ideas, which is awesome you're saying we can do a little bit better because things are going to get more complicated because technology is not going away because smart people everywhere are trying to create the coolest shit, which is awesome, but it's also mm -hmm. a way too fast for our brains to, to, uh, you know, conceptualize. We have you know, some ancient brains doing ancient shit, but, uh, anyways, that's what I think. So, I'm curious about two things. So I love everything that you just said, but I'm curious about two things specifically. So what do you notice is happening for you right before you go into doom scrolling? What's what's going on inside of you? When do you find yourself doing that behavior specifically? Number one is probably just boredom. Mm. That's number one. Like, I feel like yeah, like I don't have anything else to do. My fiance is probably not around and I'm just like not doing shit. Um, <laughs> so that, that's number one. And um, second is most likely when I have a, like a lot of things on my mind and I'm feeling a bit overwhelmed and I haven't mm -hmm. decided what's my most important task. So everything seems like it's just like I got to do everything. And then I'm like, okay, maybe I'll just get on my phone first and then you know, away we go. And I've avoided, you know, doing some of the things that I need to get done. So those are probably the two uh, most relevant things where I start to scroll a little bit longer than I want to. Um, mm. It used to be when I couldn't sleep very well. And that was just mm. a bad habit that I had to break. Um, mm -hmm. So I'm glad I did that because that didn't make mm. me sleep any better scrolling on my phone while I was in bed. Word. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, there's good data uh, on that. <laughs> yeah. So that, that was a great change that I made. But those are those are two but mostly it's the it's the boredom one. And I'm trying yeah. to get to a place where once I feel that boredom, like let's just like go for a walk or something, mm. you know, um, mm. or do something that a little bit different than that. Um, what if yeah, you, what if are, you designed a board practice for yourself? Because it sounds like 
you're, you're trying to get away from boredom still, even in this, like, oh, let's just go for a walk. Like, what if instead of trying to get away from feeling bored, you just felt bored for a little bit mm. and saw what bored feels like, right? Like, what's the biggest threat of feeling bored? Feeling bored. <laughs> right. And yet we all like kind of run away from it. Like, oh, it's so yeah. boring, right? I don't want to be bored, right? Like, minds love things to do. I, I, I'm a recovering perfectionist. And like, I love checking off boxes. I have a Trello board. I have multiple Trello boards, right? Like mm -hmm. I, I do a lot of project management in my life. I create projects and then I make lists and then I check off the boxes and I love yeah. that. And, um, when I'm not actively doing stuff, that sense of like, oh God, oh God, oh God, all of these tasks that I created for myself are really building up, right? Like all of this like busy work that I made for myself and I start to feel really overwhelmed as well, right? I find that's a lot of times when I'll go into my phone is when I'm trying to escape feeling overwhelmed. Um, yeah, some, sometimes when I'm trying to escape feeling bored too. Um, and it's, it's an interesting thing to start to look at, like, what are what are happening in the moments before we choose doom scrolling? Like, what are the things we're trying yeah. to get away from? I did hear that you identified some really important ways that you use social media. It sounds like they are really values driven. And I'm curious, in those moments when you're out finding these people who are like doing like world changing things, what what are you moving toward in that moment? Like, what's your North Star? What's the value there that you're that you're walking toward? Do you know? Um, well, my uh, my most important values are uh, like honesty, kindness, resilience and zestiness. Those are like the, mm. the values that I that I live by. But I yeah. I have a massive transformative purpose, which I like as my lifetime goal. Um, which is to uh to end mental suffering that's sort of that's where that's where everything leads to and so the people that i try and find are people who are doing that sort of work and and and, mm -hmm. and i like to explain like suffering not in a way like i'm not going to cure mental illness it's not what i'm talking yeah. about but i'm sure. talking about just like these everyday things like the suffering that people go through that they could do something about the overwhelm mm -hmm. the stress the anxiety the stuff they could work on not the stuff that is like much outside of our control and so that's always my North Star. So all of my values and my actions and my thoughts try and move in that direction. So when I'm looking mm -hmm. for people, I try and look for them in that scope. Now, maybe not, it's, it's not directly aligned with that. Some people I mm -hmm. talk about in fitness or nutrition, but I think it all aligns to basically trying to be the best version of ourselves in greatest service of the world. But that's always been my, my North Star, my, my massive transformative purpose. Mm -hmm. That's where mm -hmm. best. Yeah. So. I'm wondering if, if you were to, before you hop on your phone and do a little doom scrolling, and this is a little bit of what the book helps you to do, right? Like if before you hopped in there, you took just a three minute pause to just like sit, be bored, notice what's there, and then to actually choose, to intentionally choose, you set that intention I'm going for zestiness right now. I'm looking for connection. I want to, in this next thing I do, connect with someone who is like really taking a stance on something I believe in. And I'm going to connect with them, right? Like not just like look at their shit quietly, like a peeping Tom, right? Like I'm actually going to connect <laughs> with them, right? Like how might that change your experience of being on social media? That would, that would be, uh, make a huge difference. Huge difference. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I, I should be able to, I should be able to, I will attempt nice to, uh, I will attempt to try that practice. Cause it's important. experiment. It's all yeah. an experiment. Yeah. Right. Exactly. Psst. Um, I think another thing that gets me in trouble is like, that my my greatest fear is uh, not actualizing my full potential. So it's like mm. something that I think about all the time. So when I feel like in that moment I'm not doing anything, mm. I, I, I'm wasting time. I should like 
should be, should be, should like, this is my athlete brain on overdrive, mm -hmm. which I've, mm -hmm. I've tried to figure out over a long period of time, but it's still there. And I think that chip on my shoulder is a good driver, but sometimes it's been unhealthy. As my fiance says, I, I shouldn't work for 15, 16 hours a day, but you know, it is what it is. Uh, sure. And so that in those moments, I think I also think about that, my biggest fear. And if I do nothing, which is be bored, is it better than to maybe be on my phone? Cause potentially something I feel like I might be doing something. Uh, and so mm. that's also a battle that I, that I run through, uh, in my head when thinking about this sort of stuff. So to totally right. Like the, the, I too have the thought that if I'm on my phone scrolling, I'm doing something. It's a very mm -hmm. compelling thought in there. It, it doesn't mean it's true, right? It just means it's a thought that I sort of like buy into. Sometimes you are. Sometimes you're actually doing something in there that's meaningful, right? And yeah. my guess is if you were to take that pause and to set that intention and then to like go get it, you would actually be doing meaningful things every time you use your phone. Yeah. Right. It's, it's when we're in that autopilot, that autopilot mode, that's like, oh my God, don't, don't just sit around. Don't be bored. Don't just like, you're not actually like, you're not like hitting your potential. You're not like maximizing yourself. You're not optimizing your time. Right. Like all of these like drives to produce and become right. It's, 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 I do the same thing with my kids. Oh my God, if I'm not going to do this and this and this and this, and I create this list of all of these things that we need to be doing and then moving, 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 and then everybody go, 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 go. Right. And, and the trouble with that is that like we get to the end of our lives and the whole time we've been paying attention to where we need to go. Right. But where we go is dead. That's the end, right? Like that's the end. Right. So if it's like, go, 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 go we never have an opportunity to see what's here for us. Right. And so like, I, I hear you on the working for 15, 16 hours a day. I can, I can create stuff. And like, I am, I am like prolific in terms of the projects that I create for myself. I'm, I, I have many different books that I'm always writing in my head. Like right now I'm, I am crafting a story about, uh, it's a, it's a children's book about, grief and loss called a pigeon named Fenway. And it's about a pigeon who falls in love with a dove named Babe and Babe has to go to New York. And it's all about grief and loss, right? So like, I've, we've got all, like, we create things and it's, and there's a little bit of a difference between like, I'm, I'm doing this to get away from something <laughs> and I'm doing this to go towards something. So when you are like trying to like self-actualize and like, like hit your like maximum potential, like, are you trying to get away from the fear of not doing that? Or is there something really meaningful that you're marching toward? It's, it's both. It's both. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I, I'm later in my life. Uh, it's, it's running towards, it's moving towards closer to that. Um, early on as a baseball player, as a professional wrestler, it was, it was running away from something. Um, mm. but again, that was my chip on my shoulder. It got me to some really cool places in my life now, mm. uh, trying to, you know, having all these conversations on this podcast and learning from so many different people and mm -hmm. seeing so many athletes have that same, uh, sort of instability in their mm. life. Like now I'm trying to run towards something. That's why I try to think about, you know, my core values and who I want to mm. be as my future husband and future father and mm. how present can I be? And all of these things and so i mean again not perfect still days where i'm uh, i have that sort of fear of not being enough or not doing enough they're moving me in that direction but mostly i'm trying to move towards my my north star uh, more often yeah. than not now which is nice yeah yeah and and that's the kind of thing that adds vitality to your life that's yeah. probably one of the reasons why you're still a pleasant person to be around even though you're working 15 16 hours a day I assume you're a pleasant person to be around. You're you're a pleasant host so far. So, oh, thank you. Yeah, I think I think I'm a pleasant person to be around. At least, you know, the people that I love. My mom would say I'm fucking awesome, and she's the best. So she's gonna watch this episode. She's gonna love it. So, mom, I love you so much. Um, Aw, good uh, job, mom. Yeah. No, she did an amazing job. Not, yeah, she still does. Still does. Yeah, uh, very yeah. active and supportive part of my life. So, the only person who's watched all 273 episodes of this podcast. Oh, we love her. Thank yeah. you for being such a supportive 
this is you got a good kid you're doing a great job keep it up mom. <laughs> um but uh, another thing um that i that i think about a lot we talked about women in social media um and young girls i i think a lot about men and social media and this sort of uh retracting from real life mm -hmm. um, and it's it's complicated because you know may they feel like everything they need can be found on the internet beautiful yeah. women girls that are going to interact with them uh you know quote unquote like uh, virtual sex whatever the case may be but mm -hmm. like it, it's hard to tell them like that that that's not where the good stuff can happen like how, like it's it's I don't know. It, it's hard for me to express because like we, I want them to find good mentors and good people that they can follow. They're telling them that they've got to go out to the real world and try and get rejected and fall down and get back up. And, uh, but it's so easy, so easy to get trapped in the internet. I mean, yeah. you know, coming from the, the adult film industry, that there's so many beautiful women doing a lot of, you know, stuff on the internet that can be very, very attractive to a young man. And mm -hmm. could sort of, um, I don't know what the word is, like uh, halt, let's say, their sort of development as a as a man. Um, just sort of your your thoughts on that, you know, coming from that place, and maybe what you mm -hmm. see now. Yeah, I mean, it's 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 a tough place. It is it's a tough place to be a young person in puberty, and. Um, the, the unfettered access to anything you've ever been curious about or wanted without any sort of um, like high entry cost. It's, it's really detrimental to our health and our sense of adventure, right? Like this is one of the reasons why we really need to prevent kids from having access to the internet for as long as possible, right? Like everything that they are able to access should be something that you are allowing them to access. You know, I think I think that so I've, I've worked with a lot of young men who have porn addiction, um, which, which is sort of a fun thing for me to get to do as like a former porn star. Right. It's like I was the drug at one point and now I'm helping you get off of it. Um, yeah, there's a fun pun in there somewhere, but I'm not going to do it. So, <laughs> I, you know, a, a lot of a lot of young men that I work with are um, like really curious about um, like the BDSM world or about um, these like really like kinky and sort of like risque and like fun sexual experiences that they just don't think that are available to them in real life. Right. And a lot of what we do is to like I, I have all my guys make a list, make a list of all the fun kinky shit that you think you can't do in the real world and that you're only going to be able to do in this like virtual porn experience world. Right. And then one by one, we go out into the real world and we do it. We like find those experiences. We join, I mean, not me, but I don't go to the sex clubs with them. That's, that's like me, like, a, uh, that's <laughs> my early twenties, Jenny, that's early twenties, Jenny. <laughs> Now it's 41 Jenny just designs the plan and then they go out and do it. Right. But like the, the point being that like, there's, there's a lot of fear that's keeping people stuck in porn. Right. And a lot of what the drive to porn is, is about connection and adventure and experience, right? Like we want to have those experiences and it's so scary to go out into the real world and face rejection and do that. Um, that we just sort of default into this like virtual screen world. Right. And so, um, yeah, but by the time they come to me, it, it's gotten pretty bad, right? It, it, there, there are yeah. noticeable disconnections, but every single person that I've worked with who we put on a like real life, sexy time adventure plan, they're pretty stoked about what their life turns into, you know, like yeah. once we take away porn, and that drive to go out and connect and do fun, kinky shit is just percolating in them. And then it becomes so like potent that it like actually drives them out into the world to do things, right? Like sign up for Grindr, sign up for Tinder, go out and like, just fuck, like, let's, let's do that. 
right? As part of your therapy. Um, and like, let's bring lots of condoms too, you know? So that's fun. Yeah. I mean, amazing. Like just trying to get them out into the world doing yeah. stuff. Like yeah. that's, that's pretty much it. Like, um, we have this like running joke as baseball players is that we're, uh, in, in university, we, our team, baseball teams are normally the ones that get the most girls yeah. because in our sport, we fail so often that we don't <laughs> care if we yeah. go and talk to 75 girls and 74 of them reject us. We're used to we're like, okay, rejection's fine. Back at it. Another at bat, another at bat, another at bat, another at bat. Doesn't yeah. matter. And it seems like we get quote unquote, a ton of girls, but really we're just getting a lot of ABs at bats. And then our success yep. rate is still very low, but we just don't mind having the yeah. rejection. And you know, that could be applied to every domain in your life, not just about girls, but for, for young men, you know, talking to women is one of our biggest fears that we have. And you have to have the exposure to do that just like anything else. Right. And so when you start applying for jobs or whatever the case may be, and you get rejected from the first 20, you're like, doesn't matter. Okay. Got to keep trying because I've learned yeah. this through tons of other hard experiences. And I yeah. think that part, uh, is quite important, especially for, you know, a young man who's trying to develop into a strong, healthy, masculine man, which we need more of in the society a lot, but that's maybe a conversation for a different day. <laughs> Look, I mean, I, I think if, if somebody's batting average was in the seven hundreds, right? Like you'd be it, you would be it. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> Like my understanding of baseball is that you guys are in the like three hundreds, like two seventy four, right? Yep. Like that's that's mm -hmm. a that's a lot of no's. I love this parallel <laughs> where you're like, yeah, like you just at bat, you just keep hitting, just keep swinging, keep swinging, keep swinging. Sometimes you bunt, sometimes you swing for the fences. Either way, you fucking swing, right? Unless it's unless it's a ball, in which case you better hold that shit back, like. You know, there's there's still some like knowing when to swing and when not to swing, yeah. right? But like the more you Absolutely. swing, the more you're gonna hit. Yep. Yeah. That's yeah. that's that's perfect. That's it. Yeah. Um, yeah, Jenny, as we as we sort of wrap up this conversation, um, uh, even with the technical difficulties, I freaking love talking to you. Very, very fun. Oh, uh, oh thanks, sir. But um you're you got a book. Tell people where they can find it and then uh tell anyone else where where they should go if they want more of you. Yeah, you bet. So I got a book. It's called Look Up. It will help you. Uh, it'll help you take more swings. It'll help you get unstuck from your phone and see uh, the whole baseball field available to you. So uh, yeah, you can buy it on Amazon. Would love to have you take on it's a 30 day challenge, kind of like Whole30 without all that deprivation. So um, would love you to um, hit me up on social media as well, which again, feels sort of like silly given this, but like, Make it about connection. <laughs> Connect with me on social media. I love it. Um, either my business at West Coast Anxiety or my personal, which I think is just Jenny Ketchum. Maybe it's becoming Jenny. Maybe it's Jenny Ketchum Crooks. You'll find me if you look for me. <laughs> <laughs> it's, I'm not. You'll find me. That's part of the problem. Um, and then if you are in uh, need of a therapist, hit me up at my clinic, right? Like I work with people from Washington, Montana, Oregon, and California. We have some clinicians who serve 40 different states. And so if you're real anxious about getting up to bat, give me a shout and we'll, uh, we'll help you out with that. Get you swinging in no time. Amazing. Yeah, everything she said, link below in the show notes. Um, again, thanks, Jenny. I appreciate you. Right, Aaron. Have a great day. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you very much for tuning into that episode. And if you enjoyed it, click right here, right here for another full length episode of the podcast. And please don't forget to subscribe. But most importantly, most importantly, above all else, please, please take good care of yourselves and others. And I'll see you next time. Lots of love. Cheers.